So now I'm coming to the last of summer, so now we're adding in some of you from To continue on that discussion about mercy and justice, one of the things that we always learn about on an individual basis, and as I alluded to this last night as well, is that there is a healthy form of hope, and then there is an unhealthy form of hope. There is a healthy emotion of fear, and then there is an unhealthy emotion of fear. And as believers, we always have to balance those two for our own individual productivity and constantly moving with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards it. When we talk about the faith crisis that people have in trying to reconcile either injustice that they see in the world with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what they view as injustice and salvation being exclusive in Islam in the hereafter boils down to two things that I think are very crucial for us to understand. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we don't know, and that was how he answered the angels, and that's what should be good enough for us. First and foremost, that when the angels asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he appointed Adam alayhi salam as a khalifa on this earth, Will you place upon it he who will spread corruption and spill blood? And Allah's answer was, I know what you don't know. The angels understood that Allah knows what they don't know. And I want us to take a moment to really appreciate how beautiful and profound that answer is and how many layers there are to that answer. Now to some, that sounds like if we were to take that when things are happening around the world and say, well, Allah knows and we don't know, it sounds like deflecting. It sounds like advocating our own responsibility to eradicate injustice in this world and to do what we can in this world. It sounds like we're walking away and we're saying, well, Allah will do what Allah will do. And Asam Takra Hushayk, Allah Khayyar, if it's happening to you, it may be that you think that something is evil, but it's actually better for you. And if it's someone else, then, well, Allah knows what he's doing with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about some good uh, from that situation. It sounds like us deflecting. But at the same time, there's a difference between deflecting and deferring. And I want you to recognize that difference very carefully. And alhamdulillah, you know, Sheikh Muhammad covered so many different uh, points from understanding the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a structured way. But I want us to just get this one point down. Deflecting versus deferring. Deferring what you don't understand to an alim, to he who knows all, is wisdom. Not only is it wisdom, it allows you to focus on what is in your capacity and doing what you are capable of doing and taking up your responsibility to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tasked you to do when you defer to Allah's justice and mercy. Deflecting is to be paralyzed by the circumstances around you and to say that I don't understand how many of this is happening, therefore I will not do anything, even if you don't verbalize that I will not do anything, because at the end of the day, this picture is way too big for me to comprehend, so I'm not even going to do my part in trying to, under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the overwhelming power of Allah, do my part. How do we strike that balance? I actually want to take it to a very personal story, a very personal look at Omar Musa Allah ta'ala. When you think of Umar ta'ala, do you think of a man who has hum, has concern for the situation around him? Yes or no? And don't just say yes because you think I'm, I'm demanding you to say yes. I want you to actually think of the character of Umar as you've heard of the character of Umar ta'ala, as you know of Umar Does he strike you as a man who's passive? Yes or no? No. Does he strike anyone in here as a man who's passive? No. Okay, good. He's not a very passive man. In fact, Umar anhu, when he sees injustice, he demands justice at that moment. And he does it in unprecedented ways. And Umar anhu, his 
His entire conception of that is that if you're on the truth, make it happen. And if it's falsehood, make it go away. That's why he's al -Farouk. He is the denominator. He is the one who distinguishes between truth and falsehood, and he's not just the one who distinguishes of it in a conceptual sense, but a one who, imp who implements and executes on the basis of what he sees as truth and falsehood. And because of his sincerity to his conviction, Allah guides him in a way that he is muhaddaf, spoken to, or inspired towards truth, naturally inspired towards truth, in a way that the revelation of the Qur'an agreed with the opinion of Allah in numerous situations. That's how sincere he is to his convictions. And that's how sincere he is to his implementation of those very convictions. He's a man who has great concern for the world, a greater concern for his deen, and doesn't distinguish between the two. Has great concern for the rights of Allah, and great concern for the rights of the people, and even great concern for the rights of animals, right? I mean, that's Allah radiallahu anhu, a man who has great concern for safeguarding all of those things. And so that covers both this life and the next. He's a man who cannot sleep at night because he's tormented by the idea that a donkey in a faraway land that is by extension under his authority will testify against him on the day of judgment because its owner overburdened him. Think about how deep that is. I'm worried about an animal. And if I'm worried about an animal, then how worried am I about a human being getting their rights? I'm worried about an animal that I will never see or ride that resides within my territory and whose owner burdens it. And that animal showing up on Yom al and testifying against me. SubhanAllah, can anyone think of greater heaven than that greater concern? And it wasn't like Omar oh, well, I'm who composed this in some couplets of poetry. It was Omar oh, well, I'm who literally crying about and worried about. That's a man with great hem, who really has great concern. I don't think any of us have concern that rivals it. And one of the things that made his grandson so much like him, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, so much like him, is that Omar ibn Abdul Aziz also felt overwhelmed, a sense of being overwhelmed by the injustice that was around the world. I mean, it's kind of like one sentence he expresses it as he assumed the Khilafah at the age of 38 years old. And he looks around at the injustice, not just in the world, but within the, the territory that he has inherited as the Khalifa. He says, Muni He said, this, this earth has been filled with injustice. It's been filled with transgression. I don't even know where to start. I don't know where to start. And it was that concern that did not overwhelm him in a way that paralyzed him. It was that concern that moved him to accomplish in two and a half years, between 38 and 40, what others could not accomplish in 200 years. Do you see the point? The concern drove him to actually do something about that injustice and that wrongdoing. Now, usually, when a person is that concerned about injustice in a way that moves them to do something about that injustice, they place less currency or less importance on their spirituality or on their dua. We're so imbalanced as creatures. We're so imbalanced, and we have to recognize which imbalances we're inclined towards. Because if you're someone that's always in the field, then you might even start to degrade or belittle the spirituality portion of them. On the other hand, some people place an unhealthy emphasis on spirituality, and it's hard to, it feels uncomfortable saying that, to be honest with you, because it's misguided. Where, I'll just, you know what, I'll, I'll just say what I have to say, I'll make dua, I don't have to do anything. And some people take it to a greater extreme, which is, what's the point of dua? And yes, the world is full of injustice, so I'm not even going to try to do anything about it, because if I do something about this injustice, then what about all the other injustices? So they've lost hope in dua, they're not placing any emphasis on dua, and they have completely abandoned their own responsibility to the world around them and to solving that injustice. 
What makes a mom such a perfect balance? You know, you've met some of the people that maybe, you know, Michelle will all take care of it, they will make it easy, and it's just kind of like crossing words. <coughs> the wrong emphasis on dua. That great concern that Omar Allah had for the world that moved him, that overwhelmed him, but not overwhelming him to a point of inaction. Overwhelms him to a point of action, perpetual action. What do you think the emphasis Omar placed on Jarab What do you think Omar placed on Jarab? I love the saying of Omar Ta'ala. He said, Inni la hammal He said, I don't carry any concern about the answer to my Jarab. All I carry the concern of is the ability to make dua, the ability to make that supplication to prayer. This is deferring versus deflecting. What does that mean? Omar trusts in his dua so much that Allah will do right by it and answer it in the most perfect way that he doesn't even think about the way that that dua is going to materialize because at tawfiq ila al-amil as-salih or tawfiq ila dua to be guided to make that dua in the first place, to supplicate in the first place, or to do that good deed is a good deed in and of itself, is a blessing in and of itself that you should thank Allah for. He's like, I'm just happy if I brought myself to make dua, but once I've made that dua and said, Allahumma, I don't even think about the way that it's going to materialize. I know that Allah will do right by it, that Allah will do what Allah knows is best. I'm just concerned with the ability to make that dua, and I'm concerned about what's in my capacity and in my responsibility so Allah doesn't take me to task over it. Do you see how perfect that balance is? And what made Umar Ta'ala so special? It's the same thing with the Prophet except the Prophet perfects it more as he does with everything else. So that's in regards to the injustice of this world, that you see the injustice around you and though it seems overwhelming, you don't deflect. You defer what you don't understand to Allah because you understand that you cannot possibly be more just than the most just. And you cannot possibly be more merciful than the most merciful. By interacting with those attributes of Allah, you solve that problem for yourself and you are focused on doing what Allah gave you. Because on the day of judgment, you will not question Him, He will question you. And you're worried about it. And that's what keeps you up at night. How do I do with what I have for the things around me all under the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So if you understand that concept of Allah being just and Allah being merciful, it solves your problems for this world. And on the day of judgment, the faith crisis that comes with the question of salvation how is it that Allah will punish this person? How is it that Allah will reward this person? How will Allah do this and how will Allah do that? Do you really think that you could be more merciful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his servants? Do you really think that you will pass a more just verdict on the salvation of a person than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Be concerned with your own salvation. Be concerned with making sure that you make the best case with the most merciful on the day of judgment. You're not deflecting your responsibility of da'wah. Because by the way, da'wah is a service to you. <coughs> da'wah is a service to you. You want people to say la ilaha illallah because you love them. The Prophet wanted Abu Talib to die on la ilaha illallah out of his love for him. That's a service as well, his concern for him. Not to rack up shahada points. That's a misguided view of da'wah as well. I just went I got 10 shahadas. The lack of love that you have for the people you just gave shahada to shows in the fact that you didn't bother following up with them or making sure that they still remain upon that shahada. That love for people to have salvation in the hereafter is the same love that drives you to make sure that, you, that they have goodness in this life as well. The Prophet was acting out of the same emotion both when he was acting for that miskeen in this world and when he was asking for those that were potential masakeen in the hereafter. Spiritual poverty or physical poverty Hardship in this life or hardship in the hereafter. He didn't want to see that for people. So he took it all on for himself, but he deferred 
to Allah that which was out of his control because I understand that I cannot possibly be more merciful to a person than Allah or more just with a person than Allah. Therefore, we judge in this life on the basis of Islam, Allah will judge in the next life on the basis of Iman and He will have His mercy and His justice and His attributes are as they are. And on the Day of Judgment, what did the Prophet say? On the Day of Judgment, when people are raised up without clothes, without anything, completely bare, stripped of not just clothes but titles and everything else, all the class and all the elitism and everything that's been assigned to a person. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked by Allah, I know won't people be looking at one another? What did he say? The situation will be too severe. I might love you, but I'm not going to be checking up on you on the Day of Judgment. And you won't be checking up on me. Everyone will be completely absorbed by their own standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the spiritual sense and what their destination will be. Take that same diligence now for yourself. So when you see the faults of others in this life, you're not concerned with burying them in hell. You're concerned with inviting them to paradise, but you don't get to make the ultimate call of who gets in. You're trying to make sure that you get in as well. And that's your primary concern. How can this become unhealthy? Abu Bakr when he stood up and he said that, oh people, I hear you reciting a verse of the Qur'an. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but sometimes people recite verses of the Qur'an to their opposite meaning. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that. They take an the ayah of the Qur'an that means something completely opposite and use it to base an entire methodology of life based on an improper conclusion that they derive from that verse. So Abu Bakr says, I keep, I hear people reciting that, O people, anfusim. O people, be concerned with yourselves. You will not be harmed by those who go astray after you are guided. He said, I see people recite this verse and they say, you know what? I don't need to do anything though. Everyone else is falling apart. Everything else is ruined around me. But Allah guided us, so who cares about those who went astray? They're not harming us at all. Abu Bakr said, but I heard the Prophet saying, I forgot which one it is. That if people see evil and they don't do anything to change it, then they will all be affected and covered by that evil. If people don't do anything about the evil that they see around them, then all of them will be immersed and absorbed in that very evil that they failed to change. So Abu Bakr was saying, you're not applying the ayah correctly. You're using the ayah to deflect, not to defer. The ayah is actually teaching you to do your part and then to defer what is not in your agency to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to trust in His names and His attributes to do right by people. So yes, I would confess that my faith crisis growing up was what a lot of people would have a faith crisis with. Why do innocent people suffer? Who is innocent and who is suffering and what is the purpose of that suffering? I don't know and I have complete care for complete satisfaction and tranquility knowing that Allah is not causing someone to suffer unnecessarily and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a greater purpose and that what I should be concerned about is what I am doing to alleviate that person's suffering. And what is not in my control, I'd rather say, and that's why subhanAllah, to, to not have anyone to defer to is misery. Because it's one thing to not know the purpose of why something is happening. It's another thing to say that no one knows the purpose. In fact, there is no purpose. I am at complete ease and comfort knowing Allah is doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows is best. And we have to take responsibility as human beings. And as for the hereafter, Allah Azza wa Jalla will do with each and every single individual what is most just and what is most merciful. And I do not have to concern myself with someone else's salvation in a way that I will pass that judgment. What I have to concern about myself with is delivering that message properly. 
I've been trying to act in accordance with it myself. Don't deflect. Don't misconstrue verses of the Quran. Don't, don't twist everything to make it all fit with your worldview. Instead, defer your worldview to the one who actually created the world and sustains it. And work on what's within your world. Not only then do you move on from faith crisis, you move to faith action. Faith inspired action. And I pray that we're able to come to that perfect balance. That balance that manifested itself in a man who had so much hand, oh Allah, and so much hand, so much concern for the people that he could touch and the animals under his authority, but at the same time had no concern for how his du'a would manifest itself instead, using the same word, the same concept, said, I leave that to Allah entirely and only concern myself with the ability to do it because I move from why to what. Not why, O oh Allah, but what, O oh Allah, do you want me to do? Not why, O oh Allah, are you doing this, but what, O oh Allah, do you want me to do? And the answers are sufficient in the Quran and in the example of our beloved Prophet May Allah guide us to be just in this world and to be shown His mercy in this world and in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter us into Jannah to Firdaus by His mercy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst those that reflect in our human capacity the attributes of mercy and justice and the attributes of love and generosity and be shown the generosity and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. May Allah forgive us for not doing the good that is in our capacity and may He forgive us for doing the evil that He has sufficed us with good to not do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for the sins that we are aware of and those that we are not aware of. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for the sins that we belittle for no sin is small because of the one who is being sinned against. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be used to do that which is good in this world and not allow us to be fooled into doing evil in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judge us on the day of judgment by His mercy and not by His justice. Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 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 wa